As Dr. Potash said, I'll be talking about autism spectrum disorder in adults. Making sure they're getting out okay. Watch the step. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll be talking about psychiatric disorders, um, reviewing their prevalence, the impact that they have on daily lives of individuals, unique presentations of mood and anxiety disorders, and some multidisciplinary treatment options. And before I get started, just a disclaimer about language. Um, so I'll be using autistic adult and adult with autism interchangeably. There's been a real movement to use more identity first language or autistic adult because many people find it empowering and not viewing autism solely as a disability. Um, I've always been taught to use person first language and I think it depends on the individual. So I'll be switching between the two. So many of you have probably seen these data. This is the latest CDC estimate of autism from this year, one in 44 or 2.3% of eight year old children in the US were identified to have autism in 2018. This was based on 11 sites, including Maryland in the US. Boys were four times more likely to be identified than girls. There were no racial or ethnic differences and a third of them had intellectual disability as well. There haven't been nearly as much studies of adults, but it's thought to be similar with rates of about one to 1.1%. These were um, based on two UK studies that found that the odds of having an autism diagnosis were associated with being a man, having less education and not owning one's home. So with the increased attention and recognition of autism in children, there are a lot of adults who come to the clinic seeking a first time diagnosis. As you can imagine, there are challenges in doing so. As a neurodevelopmental disorder, it requires an early age of onset. The DSM no longer specifies how early. However, we do uh, need to know what their early development was like. And sometimes adults won't come with informants or the informants they bring may not always be reliable, might not remember details of um, the child's development or um, their ideas about what constituted typical and atypical behavior could have shifted over the years. In addition, um, just by definition, if somebody hasn't been diagnosed already, there's a greater likelihood that they'll have a more subtle presentation of autism. Um, they may engage in, in camouflaging, which refers to minimizing certain autistic behaviors in social situations, or they might have acquired social conventions that can make the diagnosis more difficult. And then um, co-occurring psychiatric disorders can share features with some of the core features of autism, which make the diagnosis difficult. So um, below is kind of a table of um, some of the major anxiety mood disorders, personality disorders that I try to think about when I'm seeing somebody on my differential. I have dementia there with a question mark because somebody came who was 72. And so I wanted to make sure that this wasn't a change in behavior indicating like a frontotemporal dementia. Um, in spite of these challenges, um, I try to use aspects of the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. It's the gold standard instrument. I'm not, I went to a workshop on it, but you have to be trained specifically to use it as a clinician and in the research setting. However, I try to ask questions to identify events that might elicit um, the individual to talk about different emotions and see how they express their emotions, other people's emotions, and to get um, a sense of how much insight they have into typical social relationships. So before going into the health and psychiatric health of adults with autism briefly, just wanna review some of the earliest history that identified a genetic basis to autism. Um, so infantile autism, a genetic study of 21 pairs over 45 years ago, the department's very own Susan Folstein co-authored this with Sir Michael Rudder. And what they did was they systematically studied 21 same-sex twin pairs, one or both of whom had been diagnosed with autism based on Leo Connor or, or Michael Rudder's criteria. And most of them, they um, took blood samples to determine zygosity, and then they had a blinded reader who determined um, a diagnosis of autism. And in total, they had 11 monozygotic pairs, 10, mono, 10 dizygotic pairs. And you can see here four or 36% of the monozygotic pairs were concordant for autism in comparison to zero of the dizygotic pairs. In addition, they looked at cognitive disorders, including a need for special education, 
um, IQ below 70, and there was also a high degree of concordance for those um, disorders in the monozygotic pair. So obviously it's very complex, but this was a landmark study in identifying the hereditary influence in the etiology of autism. Um, like I said, it's quite complex, but um, this study came out from Nature Reviews this past summer. Um, and it's a really nice overview of the, where the genetic basis stands now. Over a hundred genes and more than a dozen um, copy number variant uh, loci impart risk for ASD. This figure here um, shows the significant risk loci for autism on the left compared to schizophrenia on the right. I don't know if there's a little pointer. No. Um, but you can see here in autism, um, the majority of genes that have been identified are de novo damaging um, copy coding variants shown in the red dots in comparison to schizophrenia, where most have been um, identified as single nucleotide polymorphisms and genome-wide association studies. And just um, another figure illustrating that for the top um, rare risk genes in ASD, they have a higher relative risk of imparting um, risk for idiopathic autism compared to in schizophrenia. And the review does a really nice job of talking about convergent neuroscience approaches um, to identifying what the actual nexus of this genetic risk is. So moving on to the health status, just in general, um, Lisa Crone um, did a, a wonderful study um, of Kaiser enrollees in Northern California and compared 1,500 adults with autism to 15,000 controls. And listed here are um, medical conditions, all of which were more common in adults with autism including common things like hypertension and diabetes, as well as rarer conditions like Parkinsonism and Down syndrome. And then they also looked at psychiatric conditions and of note, um, over 50% of the autistic adults were found to have a psychiatric condition. Um, most were more likely to occur in autistic adults with the exception of drug abuse and drug dependence. And this was even after um, controlling for age, race, um, and gender. Um, part of the reason or psychiatric illness contributes to premature mortality in this population. So it's been shown that individuals die on average 20 to 30 years younger than individuals in the general population with one um, recent Swedish study finding a particularly high risk for women with intellectual disability. Many have attributed this excess mortality risk to co-occurring epilepsy and genetic syndromes, as well as psychiatric illness, suicide risk. Um, I think lack of access to adequate health care, either because providers aren't prepared um, to treat these individuals or because of the individual's own so social deficits that impede their ability to communicate and seek help. So psychiatric illness, um, the exact estimates of prevalence really vary depending on the study, um, where it was drawn from. Um, for one, individuals can, like we saw with John, have trouble self-reporting their symptoms either because they don't have the language or they lack um, the ability to self-reflect. The field also doesn't have any standardized assessments or diagnostic instruments for psychiatric disorders. And then, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of overlapping symptoms between for instance, social anxiety disorder and autism, making it difficult to parse out what is their core autistic features versus what is a psychiatric disorder. Um, I just wanna mention diagnostic overshadowing. So in the field of intellectual and developmental disability, there's a tendency for providers to attribute all of one's presentation to their underlying developmental disability and not realize that there could be um, a co-occurring psychiatric illness. And I think John's mom kind of alluded to that. So regardless of the study, if it's from the clinic or population, it's thought that at least 40% of adults have psychiatric problems with depression, anxiety, and ADHD being <coughs> most common. And not only that, but people often have multiple psychiatric disorders. So my background in geriatric psychiatry, I always think it's interesting to look at age. So this was a study in the Netherlands that looked at, um, I think 250 adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and about 170 of them had autism. 
and they compared chart diagnoses based on different age groups listed above. Um, and two thirds of them were men and they ranged between 19 and 79 years old. And although common in the older groups, um, mood disorders and social phobia were less common in the older age group. Clearly this needs to be replicated, it's small, but it might be that older adults be, have more accommodated to their social difficulties or have learned to accept their challenges. So Jimmy mentioned this earlier. Um, I work at the Adult Autism and Developmental Disability Center, also known as the Special Needs Clinic or the Adult Autism Clinic. Um, it's at Bayview in the Community Psychiatry Program, and it was started in 1999 by Flo Hackerman and Jerry Gallucci, among others. Um, below is a picture of me with a former patient and Carol Orth, who is one of our full-time psychotherapists and clinic supervisor, and Justina Stokes is the other therapist. Just a plug, we're hoping to fill two more positions um, that have gone unfilled and left a lot of people without treatment. And then we also have two occupational therapists, uh, one of whom just left, Lauren Hughes is our other occupational therapist. So in the clinic, uh, about 80% of them are men, similar to what uh, the recent CDC study found. The mean age is 35 with a median of 31. And uh, right now our youngest is 20 and our oldest patient is 76. Half have intellectual disability, two thirds live with their family and it's a slightly younger uh, group that live with them, live with their family. And, the remainder live in group homes like John do, uh, John does, um, and a small proportion live independently or with supports alone. So this chart I made just based on a chart review of diagnoses. You'll see that bipolar disorder is the most common. Um, I didn't check if that is exactly valid. I think a lot of times it was used as an indication for certain medications or if somebody had an adverse effect to an antidepressant, but it certainly is common as well as anxiety. ADHD, impulse control disorders, and depression. So moving on to specific diagnoses. Um, so depression, there is a wide range of prevalence rates in the studies, but overall it seems to be somewhere between 36 and 50%. Um, Matthew Hollix did a really nice systematic review and meta-analysis of over 20 studies looking at rates of de depression and concluded that 23% of adults had depression at the time of study and 37% experienced it at some point in their lifetime. And then this graph here is from a JAMA Pediatrics article um, that followed uh, a population-based cohort in Minnesota and um, over time with a median age of 22 at the last follow-up and looked at um, incidents, cumulative incidents of depression among other psychiatric disorders. And as you can see in the orange, uh, which is female patients with autism and the dark blue male patients with autism, they were more likely to have diagnosed depression compared to controls with um, after age 15 women with autism being more likely than their male peers. So assessing depression in adults with autism, I try to focus a lot on the neurovegetative signs and symptoms that can be objective to um, elicit, as well as using a collateral informant. As you saw, it was very important to have either a family member or a caregiver there um, if somebody's not going to report their symptoms. Somebody may not say that they're sad or feeling irritable, um, but we can observe that they're more restless, crying spells, they may have more symptoms or features of autism, including more echolalia or, or repetition of speech, as well as self-injury. Also, we see a lot of um, redu reduction in self-care. So somebody who's previously continent may become urinary incontinent, as well as other associated symptoms. And then somebody's special interest can change in character or care um, content. So John is really into cars and vans, but when he's not doing so well, he'll talk about him breaking the vans, them being broken down, them being damaged. Um, <clears throat> so depression um, can be elicited either through the traditional DSM disorder or eliciting these other symptoms. Moving to bipolar disorder, um, there's been less study of this, obviously, um, but the rates are lower than depression, as you can imagine, with somewhere between 5 and 25 percent um, of adults experiencing bipolar disorder. And the same meta-analysis that I mentioned earlier found a pooled prevalence of around 7 percent 
which is similar to what this same JAMA cohort found. Um, they found a cumulative incidence of 7% in individuals um, in Minnesota by the time they were 30 uh, with no gender differences. So bipolar disorder in adults with autism, as, as I think is true in just the general population, we always have to remind caregivers and parents, it's not just somebody being aggressive, right? Or being irritable. There has to be a clear exacerbation of irritability or change in, in demeanor above and beyond their baseline with other symptoms. Um, so some individuals, even though they can become aggressive, they can also um, later apologize for their behavior, feel remorseful. They might tell other people what to do and act as if they know better. And it's always important to use a collateral informant. Um, so this is a sleep chart from another patient of mine. Um, and it, it's helpful to have these from group home staff, awake overnight staff, check on how often um, they're asleep or awake, usually every hour, this is every 15 minutes. But you can see that the blue S's are when they're uh, sleeping and the A's are when they're awake. So I always ask caregivers to bring these charts to appointments so that I can assess how the patient's doing and how they're responding uh, to treatments. So anxiety, um, this I think is one of the most challenging um, disorders, uh, anxiety disorder NOS and specific anxiety disorders to diagnose because of the wide degree of overlap. Um, and studies have found a very wide uh, range of prevalences between 15 and 76% of adults. Um, that meta-analysis narrowed it down to 27% of adults experiencing current anxiety and 42% throughout their lifetime. And again, the cohort study also found that autistic individuals were more likely to have clinically dose, uh, diagnosed anxiety with a cumulative incidence of 50% by age 30. Um, so as I said, this could be quite challenging to diagnose because of the overlap, but I think John is a good example of somebody who um, has autism but does not have impairing anxiety by any means. Um, he's, like his mom said, as long as he knows about change in advance, he doesn't get too anxious. Um, so I think we need to remember that impairing anxiety in an actual problematic disorder is not a defining feature of autism nor universal. Um, so people may uh, display excessive fears of change and a lot of anticipatory worry before um, a change happens. And these can be just small changes in routine. Um, they may not express feeling like they're going to be judged in social um, situations, but they might feel confused or embarrassed. And then they can also have unusual phobias like crying babies, graffiti, even beards. Um, so these are some of the atypical or unique presentations of anxiety in autistic adults. Um, so I think it's, it's important to look about, think about risk factors and outcomes of psychiatric illness. Um, and we need longitudinal large studies to do so. Um, two such studies, one was the Special Needs and Autism Project that looked at almost 100 and 60 uh, individuals between the ages of 12 and 23, and they administered a strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which um, elicited emotional problems, conduct, ADHD. Um, and they found overall that people tended to decline from uh, in their pattern of symptoms once they reached early adulthood. And earlier, higher adaptive functioning or having the necessary skills to do your day-to-day -day things like self-help, competence, social communication was predictive of a faster decrease in symptoms. And then Matthew McCauley um, and others recently published a study uh, looking at psychopathology trajectories in almost 200 people. They um, modeled psychopathology based on scores of the child behavior checklist and the adult behavior checklist that they administered at five different time points between the ages of nine and 25. And then they used the scores to model ADHD, anxiety, and depression. And they also looked at adult outcomes using the social and emotional functioning interview, which defined a positive outcome as having a friend that you could re rely on for support, living independently and um, having a employment. And so these are the three graphs. The top is ADHD, supposed to model ADHD. The uh, top right is to model anxiety and the bottom is depression. And they found that a two class fit 
but modeled the trajectories. Um, and just overall, 60% of the individuals belonged in one of the higher symptom class, one or more of the higher um, trajectory classes. And I found it interesting that higher um, verbal IQ as a child was predictive of being in the higher symptom class for anxiety. Part of this could be maybe you're more likely to elicit it in somebody who can express it, um, as well as um, higher adaptive skills earlier on predicted a steadier decline in symptoms. And then finally, um, for more cognitively able individuals, being in the higher symptom class of anxiety and depression was associated with less positive outcomes. So it's really the psychiatric disorders that affects one's functioning. And there was no difference in achieving positive outcomes for people with intellectual disability. So substance use disorders, this is the one psychiatric illness disorder that seems to be less common in autistic adults. Um, I just copied here the, the Crone data where uh, drug abuse wasn't as common. And it's thought that people might not have access to it. Their intellectual disability decreases the risk as well as um, less risk-taking behavior. However, there's been increasingly studies showing that this is um, can be significant um, with ADHD family history increasing the risk. Um, I always make sure to assess for especially marijuana and alcohol as a lot of the patients will use it to alleviate their anxiety. And a recent um, mixed method study, an online questionnaire, so a self, people self-diagnosed found that women may be a particular risk. Um, so as you can imagine, and as I mentioned, psychiatric illness in a adults with autism, studies have shown that they have poor integration into the community, uh, worse vocational outcomes and social functioning, lower life satisfaction, um, higher levels of ASD symptoms, so more withdrawal, um, echolalia, and then there's the significant risk of suicide. Roma Vasa gave a wonderful grand rounds on this. Um, and it's routinely been found that individuals with autism, both with and without psychiatric illness, are at increased risk of suicide. One study found they can be up to nine times more likely to experience suicidal ideation and up to six times more likely to attempt it. Um, so it's always important to assess for that, even in individuals with intellectual disability. So from the words of an, an adult with autism, John Williams um, contributed a chapter to Chris McDougall's um, Primer on Autism Spectrum Disorder, which is really nice review of autism if anybody is interested. And he wrote, anxiety rules my life, constant worries and fears plague me, sometimes leading to dysfunction. Managing these feelings is the biggest challenge I face. Um, he writes that he takes sertraline, which has helped lessen his anxiety and improve socializing. And he's an accomplished collage artist. Um, this is his portrait of Abraham Lincoln. He said that the Civil War is one of his consuming interests. So looking just at treatment of psychiatric illness, I always try to think, break it down and uh, when I'm seeing a patient into medication, psychotherapy, and other interventions. 